I think the human condition it, it requires that we have a more interactive architectural experience than just four walls and a roof. Business of Architecture, Episode 319. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's guest has a remarkable story. He grew up with a father who ran a successful and well-known architecture firm in St. Louis, Missouri. Following in his father's footsteps, he went to Cornell University to study architecture, and that's where we met back in our college days. Today's guest is Thomas Wall. He's an owner of Mitchell Wall Architecture and Design based in St. Louis, Missouri. The firm's work has been awarded numerous awards, and in 2017, Tom was listed as one of St. Louis's five under 40. Tom is the kind of person that always has a smile for you. And from what I knew of Tom at school, he gets people. And he's used this ability to understand and relate to people to successfully grow the firm. What you'd never guess unless you know Tom personally is that while he was at school, his father passed away unexpectedly. And in today's episode, you'll hear how Tom bounced back from this challenge, from those dark days, and how he found his place back in architecture. You'll be moved, touched, and inspired. Here's my interview today with architect Thomas Wall. Thomas Wall, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you. So fill us in. We went to school together. This is fantastic. Many, many, many moons ago. And now here you are running a management position in this architecture firm, Mitchell Wall. How did this happen? Uh, well, it's been a long time. Uh, let's see. My, my, I took kind of a circuitous route to architecture. I mean, I, I started off freshman year of architecture school with you, obviously. And, um, you know, I had every intention of becoming an architect. It was something I grew up around. My dad uh, actually started the, the family architecture firm um, back in 1977, I believe. And uh, so I grew up surrounded by architecture, you know, on weekends coming into the office. And, uh, you know, at that point it was, uh, you know, the old blueprint machines and you know, my dad would use me on summers to go dump out the ammonia and things like that. So, you know, I, I grew up around the trade. And so when I went to school, I had every intention of continuing in that line. But then uh, the summer before my sophomore year of college, uh, my dad passed away quite suddenly. Um, you know, he hadn't been a drinker or a smoker or anything like that. He ran, you know, eight miles at a stretch on an almost daily basis. He, there's no reason he should have died, but one morning he was on the treadmill and had a heart attack. So um, after he passed away, the last thing I wanted to do was be surrounded by things that reminded me of my father. So, you know, I, I packed up my bags. I went back to school. Um, and of course went right back to architecture school, which did nothing but remind me of my father. And so um, I took that, uh, I, I, I left architecture school at that point. So after my sophomore year of architecture school, I, I, I switched over to the English department. Uh, I wound up getting a degree in medieval literature, uh, which when I graduated, my mom said, congratulations, now you can design castles. So I, uh, you know, I, I, I went out to LA and, you know, just didn't really do much of anything of any sort of uh, purpose. I guess you could say I was finding myself. Um, we had some interesting jobs. I did. I was a DJ, a uh, club DJ. I managed to DJ for a number of celebrities because I got in with this A-list party planner. Uh, you know, I did a, a, a beach house party for Matthew McConaughey and I did a Marilyn Manson's 30th birthday party. So I mean, I was having a degree of success as a DJ, but, uh, you know, I just wasn't the life I wanted. One day I, I, I was 27 years old. I was behind the turntables. Hadn't seen the sun in three days because, you know, I was, living a nocturnal lifestyle. And I just thought to myself, this can't be it. This isn't what I'm doing for the rest of my life. So I uh, applied to graduate schools and wound up going to uh, the University of Kansas. And uh, I got my master's there in architecture. 2011, I, I came back to St. Louis. Now, in the uh, interim 12 years between 99, when my father died in 2011, my mom had managed to keep the business going. I mean, she's not an architect. She had run the business end of things uh, for the time that my father was, was alive and, and that allowed him to be the architect and, and she would do payroll and things like that. 
But for those 12 years, she kept the firm going and uh, she did it, you know, through sheer determination and force of will, I think, uh, especially through the recession. So when I came back in 2011, I mean, we were a skeleton crew. It was my mom in the front office and then there was three of us in back and and we were taking anything that would come our way. Uh, front, I remember we were doing a front door design at one point. And, and they, these were the things we were doing to keep busy. Um, but when the recession finally started to, to peter off and come back to life, uh, we started to get busier with bigger and bigger projects. And, uh, you know, thankfully, we had this established name for a firm in St. Louis uh, so that when people did start to feel comfortable spending money again, uh, we were at the forefront and, and able to, to still capture that interest. Um, but since 2011, I've, I've been in the process of buying the business for my mom and uh, going for the second generation of the family firm. What have been the biggest challenges from just jumping right into the architecture firm and, and growing it and everything that that entails? You know, it, it is not a standard path. Um, I had internships, obviously, when I was in college and things, but I, I was uh, I, I didn't have to go from graduate school to a huge firm where I spent six years doing bathroom details. Uh, I never got pigeonholed into one section. Um, being in a smaller firm, and and this is something that I try to do in my in my management of the firm as well. Um, it, it's a more nimble system, and, and you can use people for what they're best at. So somebody comes in and they show a proclivity for a certain skill set, right? and it, it only makes sense to, to let them do that. So you, you bend the business around using people to their strengths. I, I hired a, a woman who uh, had come, you know, she had her master's in architecture. She'd been practicing in a large firm for years. And when she uh, came to us, she showed a real interest in, in a real uh, skill for interior design. I wound up building an entire interior design department around here, around her. And I mean, as a result of that flexibility, uh, her side of the office makes as much money for the office as my side of the office does. So it's um, it's the beauty of having one of these small firms is that you can you can do that, you can change. Now, like I said, that's, that's very different from what most people had to go through. I was able to come right in um, I didn't obviously immediately take over a management role. I mean, there, there probably would have been a mutiny, uh, but uh, I came in and, and, and underneath uh, my mom saw how things were done and, you know, cut my teeth on sales calls and, and things of that nature. And, you know, like learning how to ride a bike, uh, she ran behind me holding onto the handlebars in the seat for a while. But once she let go and I was able to do it on my own, she took a, a step back and I started heading up the firm. So it's, it's, it's not your standard story. I didn't have to hustle to uh, get the clients at the beginning. You know, there, there was already something to step into, but it's, I had a friend who, when I was going back into grad school, um, she was working at the office. And I said to her, I said, I don't know how I could ever do what my dad did. I don't know how I could ever take a business and, and, and start from scratch and build it into what it was. And she said, Tom, you don't have to. That's not your job. Your job is to take it to the next level. And so that's been my focus is how do I bring Mitchell Wall Architecture and Design into the 21st century? How do I take it above and beyond what it had been? What an amazing story and a reason for doing what you're doing. Yeah, well, it's uh, you combine family and passion and all these things together. And, and I mean, I am so lucky that every day I wake up and excited to go to work. That's a gift. What what's when you say getting to the next level, what does that mean? What is getting to the next level for Mitchell Wall? Well, um, you know, when dad was alive and when he was designing, there was uh, a status to having one of his homes. I mean, you'll still see real estate listings in, in the St. Louis magazines saying this was a Mitchell Wall designed home. Um, so, I mean, that kind of local notoriety and, and, and name recognition, of course, is, is a wonderful thing. But I wanted to make it more than that. Um, so I've been pushing and trying to get the firm to, to be more national. Um, it had 
<laughs> traditionally been a traditional design firm and that most of the houses that came out of here were uh, your basic traditional houses, um, colonials or Georgian or, or things of this nature. And um, we have developed a, a much stronger contemporary design and modern design uh, aesthetic. We still do our fair share of traditional homes. And I mean, I love doing them. They, they, they have their own challenges and, and they push me to be uncomfortable, which is of course the only way to grow. Um, but uh, we also do the contemporary stuff. So what is it to me? It is growing the firm beyond what dad had brought it to is getting out into a broader market, i.e. the rest of the country and world and um, breaking out of the traditional aesthetic and going into to new and exciting design styles. Got it. And in terms of expanding the markets, getting out there to other locations, what are your strategies for doing that? Is that something that's working now, something that you're working on? That's, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's an a, a interesting question. Um, and the reason is because there's not really a step-by-step process. There's no how-to book. On, on, on breaking out, I, I, there, there probably is, but not specific to architecture or the, what I'm going through. Um, what has been, I mean, the first thing I tried was uh, uh, I hired an SEO company, a search engine optimization company. And uh, they've actually, uh, we've been with them now for five or six years and, and I can't recommend it enough. I mean, that 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 is an investment that has come back to me tenfold. But uh to get out of just the St. Louis market and into other markets, the, the first attempt was through uh, making ourselves known through search results in those other markets. You know, we tried regionally going with Tulsa, Kansas City, Nashville, those kinds of areas, so that if you searched for the architects in those areas, our names would pop up. Um, what wound up happening is we would get calls from those areas, but the second they find out we were in St. Louis, the interest would, would, would wane. Uh, so we had to figure out another way to, to make this happen. Um, and so while we are still using the internet to that advantage and to that end, uh, we're doing it through Facebook and social media and Instagram, getting our images out there. I mean, that is the, the world we live in right now where people are, are fascinated by something they find on Instagram and then they pursue it further. And so all it takes is that one image winding up in the right person's lap uh, or, you know, iPhone, and uh, you're getting calls from another market. So, I, I mean, just this year, we've done House in Colorado. We're doing one in upstate New York. We've got one, uh, we just got a call about a nine-family homestead on a farm in Arkansas. So, we're getting into other markets, and, and, and that's really exciting for me. And from a marketing perspective, what has been most effective for you that you've seen? We have always done print advertising in the St. Louis area. Um, and as I mentioned, we most recently uh, have switched into uh, doing more social media stuff. Um, we track where all of our leads come from. Uh, when second somebody comes through the door, we, we ask them, you know, how did you find us? Word of mouth is always big. Print media is, is really falling off. And uh, most of our stuff is coming through either Google searches or people have seen our work on Instagram or Facebook. Right now, our social media is probably the biggest generator of work for us. And it's, uh, you know, I don't think that's by coincidence. That makes sense. Wow. Tom, I'd like to circle back here. We have a shared experience that we had at going to architecture school together, and we do have a number of people who are either students or who recently out of school or even the old timers love to talk about the old school days. But I'm just curious from your perspective, let, let's talk a bit about what was our first year like at Cornell? What was it like going, especially your perspective, being raised in a family with a father who is an architect, then going to architecture school? Was there anything when you got through, wow, I did not expect this, that was just totally different than when you expected? And what was it like that first year of architecture school for you? First year of architecture school, I don't, I, I didn't go in with any expectations. Um, I don't know if that was for any other reason than I was just immature at the time. Um, it was just a new experience. I was excited. I was excited to get away from home. Um, but also, I mean, my, my, my experience of practical architecture um, 
was pretty minimal. You know, I, I had taken an architecture class in high school, but I mean, that really didn't expose me to much. And even though I grew up around it, it wasn't like I was going through the problem solving of design challenges or resolving issues of details or, or any of the, the actual things that occur. Um, my freshman year of architecture, I remember, I remember freshman year of architecture school very well. I mean, it, I loved the way that they organized the, uh, the projects. I don't know if you remember this, but our first project we got, uh, everybody in studio was assigned um, an item. It was like an instrument or a tool or something like that. Mine was a, a handheld can opener. First, first thing we had to do was a freehand drawing of the can opener. Then the next assignment was we had to do a hard line drawing of the item and, you know, section to elevation plane. And we had to do those to scale. So they were, they were teaching us, and, and for kids in school today, we used to do a thing called drafting, which involved pencils and pens, <laughs> paper. <laughs> but uh, we, would, uh, we did the hard line drawings of in the, the analysis of this item, and eventually through a process of smaller projects got to our final project, which was we designed a container to hold the item, and then ultimately a store to sell the containers. And so what that taught me and a lesson that I apply still today is the importance of having a theoretical premise behind your design. It's not enough to some say, design a store and you design a store. You need to know what is going to inform that design. How do we get from a handheld can opener to a store through a series of steps? And how do we know that that store sells can openers without looking at the items? So that that's... Uh, I think was probably one of the most formative experiences uh, of my education was, was that understanding of um, the, the, the design development from thought and theory into the uh, actual uh, completed product. And that was something they did pretty well at Cornell was try to get those philosophical underpinnings, that theoretical kind of basis around the design that would then generate the solutions. I, I remember that. I remember mine was, I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> I remember, I think of my professor's name, her name was Melody Jackson. She, I was in her little studio group and she was fantastic. She was, I think, I think she had been, she'd come from the, some like the University of Nashville or, or Kentucky, somewhere in the, in the South. And anyways, fantastic woman. And she... I had this this tool that it turned out to be like I would never realize it turned out it it looked like it had a handle right and it had a yeah. bunch of washers in it that were it had two two rows of washers that were that had the bolts through the middle mm -hmm. and ultimately what I discovered it was through some research is that it was is a knife sharpener. Oh. But it wasn't a typical you you'd expect most of them made with flint or some sharpening material sure. but this one was like metallic so I do remember that and that what what a fantastic project that was and completely different than what I thought we were going to be doing, you know, coming, you know, what does this have to do with architecture? Well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, having that experience and then going to the University of Kansas and juxtaposing those two universities, how they uh, approach architecture. I mean, Kansas was a much more practical experience. That was, you know, working uh, to develop the student uh, to go out and function in a practicing firm. You know, how, how do we make real people? Whereas Cornell was, was you know, cerebral. Um, I think schools like Cornell, you know, Michigan, all the, 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 the top architecture schools out there, uh, their goal is to create lead designers, business owners, um, to get the, the theory and the philosophy into the student. Whereas if you go to at the other end of the spectrum, you know, the technical schools, that's where you're getting, you know, that they're, they're educating the student to uh, go out and practice, go out and, and be a, a part of a firm and be able to accomplish things. Now, that's not saying that they're not teaching theory down at, you know, U Tech or whatever, and that doesn't mean that they're not teaching practical stuff also at the Cornells and, and Harvards of the world. Uh, it's just to say that their emphasis is skewed depending on which way they want to push you. And I, frankly, I wish that I would have understood that when I was doing my school selection. I think a lot of students don't, that there really are these lines of thought 
that the different schools have. And there, it really is important to kind of align what you want to do in the future and maybe your passions to the kind of school you end up going to because you're right. I mean, a place like Cornell, highly theoretical, highly design focused, you know, hopefully turning out the next Mies van der Rohe <laughs> or, you know. Uh, it, it's admire. not going to be for everybody. And the problem is, is that if you send somebody to a school that is theory and philosophy based and they are more interested in structural engineering, it's going to make them leave the profession and go do something else. I mean, I, that being said, you look at uh, people who graduated with us and you look at where they've gone with their lives. Very few of them are actually practicing architects. Um, there's a lot of graphic designers, a lot of industrial designers. There are a few practicing architects out there, and there's some very successful ones from our class. Uh, but, you know, a, a good majority of them have, have – one, one of them is a jewelry designer that I know of. It's, it's, they, they've, they've gone out into other areas. This one guy I know actually started a podcast on the business of architecture. So yeah, I mean, who would that be? <laughs> it could go all over. <laughs> Now, Tom, th speaking of that, you know, friends, acquaintances, I mean, one thing that I remember even from, from school is that you seem to be a guy that got people, meaning that you understood and you kind of got the human dynamic of, of interacting with people, of understanding where they're coming from, of just making friends with them. And is that the case? And if so, how has that helped you in the profession of architecture? Well, um, because I am the firm owner, 50% of my life is doing sales. I, I, I never have a full day at my desk and uh, being able to talk to people, being able to, to hear them and, and pick up on subtle cues and behaviors and, and yeah, being able to, to make friends, even if it's for a short brief amount of time, it's an important skill to have. Uh, it makes you more hireable. If you're looking to get a job, it makes you more saleable when you, when you are out there trying to push your product on people. Um, nobody wants a slick salesman. Nobody wants this stereotypical used car guy who's going to cut you a deal and get you in this car. What's it going to take? That, that's not the kind of person that you want designing your home. Designing someone's home is an intimate experience. The, I, I have to know how someone lives. I have to know what they do on a daily basis. I need to know about their family. I need to know everything. And, uh, you're not going to do that with somebody, at least you're not going to do that well with somebody that you don't trust, that you think is smarmy or slick. It's important to, to be able to reach people on a personal level and to, to listen to them and hear them and understand them. Um, I don't know that it's a skill that necessarily can be developed. I think there are just people out there who um, have a better concept of, of, of hearing other people, but I will say that believing in your product is first and foremost, the most important thing when it comes to that. And whether that product is you or that product is architecture or that product is widgets, it doesn't matter. If you believe in it, then you don't have to do a high pressure sale. You don't have to be slick because the product itself will sell. I love it. And on the inverse, if you're in, if you're hesitant about the product you offer, the service you offer, that kind of road the confidence and it's going to be hard to to sell that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, what, what are you excited about for the future? What's what, what's really exciting you on the horizon? You know, <laughs> I keep fantasizing that one day somebody's going to invent a new material that changes the world of architecture. Um, I don't know what that's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be the result of space exploration, which will totally change the world of structural physics, or if it will be, you know, something here that is stronger than steel, but lighter than air. I mean, we, there's going to be a development soon, I would think, that will completely transform the way we build things. Um, I'm hope that I'm alive to see it. Uh, I'm relatively certain that even if it does develop, I will probably be too old to adapt to it, but it'll be fun to watch. Uh, but those kinds of things on the, the theoretical realm are, are things that I look forward to. And the more ensconced in reality, um, things on the, that are coming up that, that are exciting. There seems to be a movement towards the human experience in architecture that wasn't there before. Um, 
you look at things like the High Line in the New York City that ends up at the Hive, those are all about the human experience. We've gone from the 1950s, you know, mass development of suburbia and urban sprawl, and we've started to bring nature back into our lives. And it's important because, you know, we, we, we remove nature too much from our design and all of a sudden we have sick building syndrome and people are suffering because they're not able to experience the outside. Um, I think the human condition it requires that we have a more interactive architectural experience than just four walls and a roof. And I'm excited to see that kind of uh, playground for the soul, if you will, develop in architectural design. Awesome. Well, Tom, thank you for joining us here today. That's a good way to wrap it up on the Business of Architecture podcast. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me, Enoch. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.